everybody. Welcome here to the Wine with Jimmy channel. All things wine is discussed here in my videos. So if you are looking for extra information or indeed you are studying the world of wine, you will find these presentations very, very useful, I hope. So welcome to what is called the Sparkling Wines, the D4 unit for the WSET Diploma. These videos follow the syllabus very closely. So if you are studying, very useful. Also though, if you are interested in the topic, you will find these videos mightily useful. So um, the Sparkling Wines of Australia are broken into three parts, as you see here. This video is available as free content, but parts two and three are only available to those of you who subscribe to my e-learning platform. Now, if you have any comments or questions, perhaps you have been to Australia, enjoyed the sparkling wines on offer in the mighty country of Australia, then please do get in touch by commenting on this video below. Okay, let's rock and roll talking about a bit of an introduction. We'll go into the styles. We'll talk about the main regions that you find uh, the sparkling wines being produced. So first of all, a little introduction. Now, Australia is a significant global wine producer. We know this, it's one of the big boys making a chunk of wine on the global market. But the sparkling wine sector represents less than 6% of the total wine crush in Australia. So this translates into an annual sparkling wine sales of about 66 million litres. And the sales are driven by the domestic market, which accounts for about nine out of 10 bottles sold of sparkling wine. It's generally, of course, quite warm in many parts of Australia and a nice crisp sparkling wine will go a long way to balance your mentality. Exports though of Australian sparkling wine have actually risen in recent years, driven by popular styles, certainly things like Moscato, sparkling Shiraz and Australian Prosecco. Yes, it does exist despite its controversy. So, they are on the up. Traditional method sparkling wines, however, are not. They are in decline. So it's the fun, popular styles that are often made by tank method, which are doing rather well. There's quite a classic producer there. So this is the uh, Chandon Winery in Yarra Valley, of course, very well set up for tourism. So that leads me into the styles. So almost all methods of producing sparkling wine across multiple styles are actually employed, used in the Austra Australian sparkling wine sector. So traditional method, transfer method, tank method, and even carbonation. And styles produced include classic blends for traditional methods, so Chardonnay, Meunier, and Pinot Noir, and then tank method from Moscato or Prosecco, and then sparkling Shiraz and Pet Nat, Petillon Natural, in very small amounts. Some great names you'll see up there on your slide, for example. So the regions. Now, grapes for traditional method sparkling wines are grown, of course, in the cooler parts of Australia. Now, it's very easy for us to say that Australia is generally quite a warm place, but it's not the case. It's a very large continent, uh, which is the size or greater than the size of Europe. And of course, you have very many different climatic zones. Yes, a lot of it is very hot, certainly in the central part. So when you're looking at sort of the eastern side of the Western Australia, the southern section of the Northern Territory, uh, the southwesterly parts of Queensland and uh, the northern parts of South Australia. Yes, 
these places do tend to be exceptionally hot. But then we have different climates when we get towards the Southern Ocean, the Tasman Sea, for example. So these colder places, which are really moderated by major seas and oceans, especially places like Tasmania, but also places like the Yarra Valley, Adelaide Hills, and then the alpine parts of Victoria and New South Wales, certainly when you look at the Victorian Alps, for example, these are cooler because of altitude as well. So these often are the prime locations for the base wine produced for sparkling wine. And you'll get the high acidity, which is a key factor here, moderate potential alcohol, and then ripe but medium intensity fruit characteristics. Uh, yields are lower than in regions producing high volume sparkling wines. And that, of course, will contribute to the higher cost that is found with these wine styles. Let's go to some of the famous parts then. So uh, first of all, the absolutely beautiful and fantastic wine region of Tasmania, the island, of course, sitting to the south of Australia. This is one of Australia's premier cool climate regions. And in fact, really, it is the only real cool climate. Many of the others that we mentioned, Mornington Peninsula, Yarra Valley, Adelaide, are kind of cool to moderate. So they kind of flit year in, year out between the two. Tasmania is cool. And it's the true star of the Australian wine, sparkling wine community. Now, the history dates back to the mid 1980s when a joint venture between the Tasmanian company Heemskirk and Champagne Louis Roderer was launched in the area. Uh, Tasmania produces, yes, some of the finest sparkling wines of Australia reflecting the very high levels of winemaking expertise and, of course, the advantages naturally for sparkling wine in a cool climate. So we have very good production of high acidic fruit from Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and much of that goes into traditional method sparkling wine, somewhat emulating champagne. The notable Tasmanian sparkling wines include House of Arras, the top left of your screen, Jans, the top, uh, sorry, the bottom left, probably one of the first to really break into the UK market, Piri on the top right, Andrew Piri wines, fantastic quality, and then Freginet as well, which is the bottom right where you see a picture of here in this slide. So Tasmania, we know, is cold uh, and it is somewhere classified as a cool maritime climate, which is influenced by the westerly winds of the southern ocean. So this is to the left of your map just there. The overall climate is similar to Champagne and parts of the Rhine Valley with a mean January temperature of 15 and a half degrees Celsius. So this is because, of course, that is their summer month, January. We often talk about those temperatures in places like Champagne being our July or August, typically August. Uh, so we are talking about quite cool being around 15, 15 and a half. So it kind of pushes it between cold and moderate in the warmth factor. Uh, but there is, of course, localized variation across the island. So, for example, the north coast of the Tamar Valley, you'll see there in the middle of your uh, top of your map, and also Piper's River sitting to the east of Tamar Valley, they are close to each other, but the Tamar Valley is much warmer and the harvests in the Tamar Valley tend to be about a fortnight before Piper's River due to the shelter offered from the cold southern ocean. Now, with the exception of the warm Coal Valley, 
and that's in the south. That's just north of Hobart on your map. Southern Tasmania is generally cooler than the warm parts of the north coast. So colder conditions here, of course, makes it quite, quite important for sparkling wine production. Now, the larger producers source fruit from different locations in Tasmania, and this gives them the access to gain the volumes necessary, blending grapes from cooler and warmer regions, of course, for balanced wine production. Growers have discussed creating named subzones within Tasmania, uh, but currently, they are content just to market their wines as Tasmania. There's always the worry of overcomplicating a region uh, in the wine industry. Spring frosts and the high rainfall annually are certainly the main challenges for growing grapes for premium sparkling wine on the island. But also the shedding of the blossom, couleur, and botrytis later on can be problematic. Certainly because it's an island, you're going to have, of course, things like fogs and uh, more fungal disease pressure. Geology. So it's really quite complex. I know this slide is a little bit frustrating because it just says soils vary throughout the island. Doesn't give you a lot of help, but I'll go through it, uh, certainly. So on the lower slopes uh, of the island, the vineyard soils feature ancient sandstones, mudstones, uh, your mulls, and also river sediments and igneous rock of volcanic origin. Uh, so quite complex. You've got um, igneous rock with sedimentary based rocks. Now, sandstone and schist appear in the Derwent Valley. Then you get these really quite peaty alluvial and sandy soils with a very low humus content in the Coal River Valley north of Hobart. Piper's River on the north of the island boasts very deep, free-draining, friable soils. And Tamar Valley is kind of next door to it. The warmer Tamar Valley is more gravelly basalt uh, with clay and limestone. Another factor why the Tamar Valley is a little bit warmer, the soils are a little bit better at that heat absorption, so that heat conductivity. Now, the state as a total only produces a small amount of wine, but really, if you ask many people who have tried Tasmanian both still and sparkling wine, they will typically say that very good is a minimum and outstanding is the best. Uh, and about a third. So in 2020, about a third of the production of wine was sparkling wine. And of course, a lot of that is made possible due to the climate, geology, but also the grape varieties grown in Tasmania. Furthermore, we're going to go to South Australia now near Adelaide to, of course, the Adelaide Hills. This has cool winters and winter dominant rainfall. And we have vineyards at about 230 to 650 meters. So there is good altitude here in an undulating landscape sitting to the east of the city of Adelaide. We get real good conditions for sparkling grapes such as Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. They help retain their acidity levels and develop their fruit flavours. Uh, the growing season remains quite dry. Despite its location, it will remain quite dry. And then rainfall can vary throughout the Hills District, increasing at higher elevations, but mainly falling in winter and spring. A large proportion of the region is fortunate enough to have really quite robust underground water aquifers with the water quality ranging from excellent spring water, uh, certainly around the Mount Lofty area, to drinkable water throughout the rest of the region. So yes, there is problematic droughts that can happen in summer, but they do have access to good water. The mean January temperature here is about 20 point 
four degrees Celsius, which is five degrees Celsius greater than Tasmania in the mean of January. So quite a bit warmer, but still considered probably as moderate to even towards warm. Uh, then we have Yarra Valley. So in the 1980s, champagne producers Moet and Chandon scouted Australia for a place to make their own sparkling wine, fine Australian sparkling wine. And yes, today, it certainly is considered some of the great sparkling wine of mainland Australia. Their base that they decided on is the Yarra Valley that you see in your picture. So this is north of Melbourne in the quite geologically and topography uh, diverse landscape of the Yarra Valley. The Yarra is one of Australia's coolest regions. Rainfall is very much winter and spring dominant and the cool, dry, humid summers mean that of course we have good production for our sparkling wine. The cool mean January temperature is about 18.9, 19 degrees Celsius. So it's less than Adelaide Hills, but still a little bit considerably more than Tasmania. So we get a long, slow ripening period with some really flavoursome grapes here. Uh, spring frosts can be a risk in the area. Other regions? So fruit for inexpensive sparkling wines is grown in a wide range of Australian regions, including Riverland, Murray Darling and Riverina, what we consider the big regions that often straddle uh, the central parts of southeastern Australia. Now, this accounts for the vast majority of sparkling wine produced in Australia. Irrigation in these areas is certainly essential and mechanisation tends to be as standard. In general, the fruit is picked very much early for lower potential alcohol and to retain acidity and, of course, to avoid overripe characteristics. Yields are here quite considerably higher than the previous aforementioned areas, typically two to three times as high, but the prices are about one quarter of the prices of places like Adelaide Hills, Yarra Valley and Tasmania. So hence, this is where we find inexpensive sparkling fruit. And of course, we need to mention sparkling red, is, which is somewhat of a speciality of Australia. This tends to be focused around the grape variety of Shiraz. Um, the, the rule here is that we actually find the fruit in warmer places. So we know typically for sparkling wine, we will grow in colder sites for high acidity with early picking. But here, warm climate regions such as central Victoria, McLaren Vale and Barossa Valley uh, where we source the fruit from. Of course, typical places where we would source Shiraz from for dry red wine. The style of sparkling reds require richness, intensity and flavour. So they will be picked at the same time for still wines. And the yields will range from high for inexpensive wines to moderate for premium and above. I'll talk a bit more about that in the next couple of videos. Well, thank you very much for this part one journey on sparkling wines of Australia. Please do join me for part two and then further part three, where we go through all the other information around winemaking, regional specialities, history and wine law, the little of it. Uh, these two parts, part two and three, are only available to those of you who subscribe to my e learning platform. You'll find the information for that over at www winewithjimmy.com. Once again, if you have any comments or questions, please do get in touch by commenting on this video below. Perhaps you've been to Australia, you enjoy sparkling Shiraz, you have a recommend of a Tasmanian sparkling wine, whatever it may be, get in touch. Make sure you click like and you click subscribe. I've been Jimmy Smith. Thank you very much. And if you find yourself in the UK, come and say hi for a class, a glass, or a bottle. Ciao for now.